have a panel called Python in Space, Curiosity Sparks. So our moderator will be Praveen Patel. So we'll be taking care of this panel session. So over to you, Praveen. Okay, uh, thank you, Balan. Uh, hello, everyone. A uh, very warm good afternoon to you all. And I must wish a warm good morning to our panelists. Uh, they are here from different time zones, and together they are going to take us to space with Python. Uh, I'm supposed to be the moderator of this session, but uh, I would love to consider myself to be a student of this amazing interactive class. Python, the language we love, is being used at various levels in the final frontier, from deep space exploration, trajectory design, navigation, flying robotic spacecrafts, to imaging black holes, and to analyze the wonders and mysteries of space. Uh, thank you all panelists for being here for this panel session. I'm hoping this to be a really interactive, fun, thrilling, and engaging one. Uh, our panelists have assured me crisp, responsive answers because they want to answer as many of audience questions as possible. It may not be a cohesive discussion today, uh, but we'll get to hear about the space adventures of the panelists. Uh, we have put together an amazing panel with these shining stars from Python Galaxy, five passionate scientists. First, we have Arthur Scholz. Arthur is a spacecraft operations engineer working with European Space Agency. Uh, he founded the LibraCube initiative uh, for promotion of the idea of open source, uh, space, open source to space exploration. Our second panelist is Catherine Scott. Catherine is currently working with Open Robotics. And prior to that, she has worked as image analytics team lead at Planet Labs. She was a co-founder of at uh, Tempo Automation and Scythe Machine. And next, we have an astrophysicist at heart, Thomas Albin. He's a space scientist, solar system researcher, and a Python developer. He now works in uh, automation industry. Uh, then we have Kazunori Akiyama and Andrew Shell. Both are astrophysicists and Python developers. They are the members of the team EHT. Uh, EHT is Event Horizon Telescope. Uh, thanks a million, everyone, for joining us. Let's make it interactive. And uh, I request audience to get your questions flowing in the chat. First few minutes, uh, uh, let's get to know a little more about our panelists. Uh, so I request each of you, if you could introduce yourself, what are you doing now? What were you doing then about your work, your passion? Uh, you may please share your screen if you wish to present a few slides. So we have three to four minutes each. We will uh, begin with uh, Arthur. Arthur, please. Thank you, Praveen. I'm going to immediately share my screen. So, okay. So yeah, um, I try to uh, summarize this in uh, in four minutes. Um, first of all, thanks for giving uh, me this opportunity to uh, um, to have a talk here and be part of this panel. And I would like to, um, um, you know, for this uh, panel on space uh, Python for space exploration, I would like to. Um, give you an overview about the LibreCube initiative, uh, which I founded um, a while ago, and the, uh, with the goal to yeah, develop an open source ecosystem for space and Earth exploration. So the vision behind LibreCube is that, well, I got, I realized that uh, a lot of systems share commonalities, be it satellites or drones or rovers, they all have a uh, for example, a power system, they have a communication system, they have onboard computers. And if we could modularize those subsystems and make them compatible and have defined interfaces, then we could have a kind of um, a reference architecture uh, or an ecosystem where we can you know, pick the components that we need to build our mission. It's a bit like Lego Mindstorm, where you can build different kinds of robots and uh, rovers uh, just by using uh, Lego bricks. The difference to Lego, however, is that our systems are designed for operation in space. 
Um, so to uh, we use space engineering uh, best practices like redundancy, uh, fail safe, uh, and these operational concepts. And we use the materials that can survive in vacuum and high temperatures. So <clears throat> I'm giving you now a couple of uh, um, examples what projects we've worked on, maybe to whet your appetite and maybe you'd be interested to join those kind of projects. And for the last two years, we have mostly focused on uh, a software projects. So we do hardware and software, but because of the uh, pandemic, uh, we stay at home. So it's very easy to develop software, but it's not easy to develop hardware remotely. So uh, we were focusing a lot on ground, uh, on software for, for the ground segment. So one example is this SLE user protocol, which is a protocol defined by CCSTS. It's a big organization to that standardize um, uh, protocols for uh, for uh, spacecraft and uh, what we did is uh, we implemented a yeah, we did a Python implementation of this SLE protocol so basically SLE is what you use um, so the uh, ground, ground station communicates with the satellite receives the data and then the ground station forwards this data to the mission control system and this data is then this stream is encapsulated in SLE um, frames so we wrote um, a library that actually you can use, you can download now, and then you can just with this few lines of code, you can basically connect to, let's say, another station or ESA station or JAXA station. And they all use this SLE protocol. Of course, you need to know the credentials and you need to be in the, in the network. But uh, yeah, so that's quite interesting. Another thing we did is, uh, a module, a Python module for uh, predicting the, the links. So when you receive a satellite, the signal might be, uh, the, the strength of the signal might change over time, maybe because uh, yeah, well, the satellite is moving and you might be moving and the satellite might be uh, change orientation. So you can basically in this module, you can set up your scenario with all the details and you can make them time dependent and then you can plot and calculate uh, your link budget, and you can see if you actually can receive the satellite data. Um, okay, this one I skip maybe. Um, and then and there's yet another project. Uh, it's uh, basically a, a viewer for solar system and satellites in space. So there are a couple of them already that or even open source that you can download. But this one is a bit special because we wanted, in the end, I mean, this is using JavaScript on the web browser. But I didn't like to code JavaScript, so I'm using this Brighton Python module. It's called Brighton. That basically is a wrapper for JavaScript. So this is using the JavaScript 3GS library, but I, I'm not coding. I, I coded everything uh, in Python. And so that's really uh, powerful, the, the Python ecosystem. Um, then here's another example uh, that's more hardware oriented. So we uh, developed um, the, uh, protocol. Well, we implemented a protocol. So CAN bus, maybe you know it, is the, the bus in your car that uh, lets all the systems co uh, communicate with each other. This has been adopted for space use. They have changed it a bit, but they want to use it in space and they're actually using it already. And we have made a implementation and even uh, yeah, implemented this on MicroPython. And we're having two boards that communicate using this um, CAN bus protocol for space. Yet another protocol I'd like to present here is for the file delivery. Uh, you all know FTP. So this one is basically FTP for space. There's, it's an open standard. Uh, it's available since many years, but it's not yet been adopted really for space use because the space industry is really conservative. They're slow to try out new things. I mean, the traditional space industry at least. So we have implemented this uh, CFTP protocol. Um, you can see on the left side would be the mission control system and on the right side you have the software running on your rover and then you can send files back and forth um, to your devices. I would also like to mention here a bit of advertisement that there's this open source CubeSat workshop where we uh, basically talk about this open source aspect in general, hardware and software, and also with a lot of focus on Python. So this was the last years. Um, and that yeah, just concludes my short presentation here, introduction. Yeah. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, great to know about these things. Uh, over to you, Catherine. Oh, hi. Um, yeah, so I'm Catherine Scott. Um, I've been a Python developer for 
probably over a decade now. Um, I guess it all got started. I did a lot of like computer vision and robotics work back in college um, and grad school. And it sort of turned into doing a lot of startup stuff. Um, you know, some of it, like I was a defense contractor for a while. Some of it was kind of tangential to space work. And then I think my first real introduction to space was working at Planet Labs. I wasn't really working on the satellite. Um, if you're not familiar, so Planet Labs has a constellation of, geez, I don't even know where they're at at this point, like a couple hundred CubeSats that do Earth imaging. Um, most of it's at three meters, but there's some higher resolution stuff. Um, so there I mainly worked on the analytics team and also the rectification team. So that's, you know, everyone thinks, oh, well, I'm going to write Python. It's going to run on the satellite or rover or whatever. It actually, you know, most of the like big, big chunk of the software is actually on the ground doing all the processing once you get the data down from the ground. So most of the time I was working with images that had just been pulled off the satellites and brought to Earth. Um, so worked at Planet for a few years, and then now I actually work for an organization called Open Robotics. Um, you may also uh, know us as um, Open Source Robotics Foundation. Um, so we we basically build two big open source projects. One is ROS, or Robot Operating System. The other one is uh, Ignition Gazebo, which is a simulator that you can sort of plug into your physics simulate or plug in a physics simulation. You can build these environments and actually test things without having to to physically have them, which has become even more um, useful as robots become more complex, more difficult to work with. And I'm sure anyone working with satellites also knows the, the value of a simulator, right? You can't always sim, you can't, you know, sim, mm -hmm. simulate conditions on the ground that exist in space, but you can do it in software. So it's really handy. Um, so, so Ross makes, um, well, I guess I should back up a little bit. Um, ROS is basically this glue code, for lack of a better word, that connects all these disparate parts that you would need to, say, build a robot. Um, and so it makes pretty extensive use of Python. ROS actually allows you to intersperse different languages, primarily C++ and Python, but also some C, um, a lot of Rust lately. Um, and lately, I don't personally work on a lot of the space stuff, but there's been more and more interest in using ROS for space applications. Um, we have a couple contracts with NASA. I can't actually speak on behalf of NASA, but I can kind of tell you, um, you know, what's publicly available about those projects. So the one I think we work on a bit is Viper, which is the um, volatiles, uh, I forget the acronym, but volatiles, it's basically looking at water and volatile chemicals on the polar region of the moon. I think they're going to announce the actual location of the mission sometime next week. Um, but you'll have to go talk to NASA about why they're using ROS and, and, and why they're testing it. I think they're using it mainly to, like I said, uh, work with data and work with systems on the ground. Um, lately, I've seen also just a lot of other work because it's open source. People just kind of pick it up and use it for what they want. So I think I've seen ROS used, I believe it was also used in the Astro B pro uh, program which are small, well, they're not CubeSats, but they actually belong inside of a, um, say, a space station, and they're designed to move around and help astronauts do things. Um, I think JPL also had, um, like, a little toy Ross simulation that you could use, which was pretty cool. Um, but, you know, not exactly working on space stuff myself right now, but I help with Ross. I help basically build the Ross community, which, uh, since it's robotics, is becoming more and more interesting for for planetary exploration and space exploration. So that's that's what I'm working on now. Uh, Great. OK, thank you so much, Catherine. Uh, mm -hmm. Over to you, Thomas. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation, guys. <clears throat> it's uh, very nice to, uh, to be here. So my name is Thomas, and um, I worked on, yeah, I studied astrophysics. astrophysics and I was part of uh, two major missions or worked on two major missions. The one was the Rosetta Fila mission. You may know the mission from ESA that landed on the comet. So there I, did, I conducted some uh, calibration experiments with some dust detector in the laboratory. Later on also, um, yeah, and making the analysis of the actual data from the comet surface. So this was pretty nice, uh, pretty nice mission back then. Uh, afterwards, I joined uh, for my PhD studies the Cassini team. So Cassini Huygens was the uh, probe that uh, revolved around Saturn, and there I was part of the cosmic dust analyzer. So again, 
dust. <laughs> um, pretty, but it's pretty interesting. So um, yeah, it was a very great time where I analyzed the data also with machine learning algorithms and so on. So I combined miscellaneous uh, topics with the with the with the with the data with the data we got from the instrument. Um, and also, yeah, my very first contact was back then in 2012, where I had an internship at the European Space Agency working on um, near-Earth objects. So simulating where are these objects and with what kind of telescope yeah, can I observe them best. So as you get, you get it that, yeah, I like the space topics, but I always focus on the very small, uh, small stuff like asteroids, comets and dust and meteors as well. So this was uh, yeah, my academic journey. Uh, two years ago, I then left academia because I said, well, I would like to extend, broaden my horizon a little bit. And I joined the automotive industry. And, but in parallel, yeah, I'm still an astrophysicist at heart. So uh, in the free time, I'm working on some projects, on some, um, some data analytics topics. So now I do not have, let's say, the academic pressure of uh, publishing papers or so. But I can really focus more on developing actual products. So really libraries or so I'm working on. Uh, honestly speaking, this was now a big summer break now for me. So I, I was no sitting in front of the computer. So I, I enjoyed the summer. So the, this PyCon India is now the perfect uh, starting point for autumn and winter to rejoin uh, my programming sessions, right? And beside the programming, um, also um, yeah, I'm writing some tutorials and it's called Space Science with Python on Medium. And I'm also now planning for winter and autumn to uh, start some uh, tutorial sessions also on YouTube because I think that citizen scientists, uh, citizen science ship is getting bigger and bigger and more important. But it's very important, I think, to channelize all the knowledge because if you take a look at Reddit or so, the, what people have kept people have crazy capabilities. So showing crazy 3D animations with Python whatsoever. And then they say, oh, please don't be so harsh with me. I'm only 16. I was like, geez, this is amazing skills, you know? So it's, uh, I think there are a lot of people out there with great, um, great skills. And I think they can really contribute a lot to, uh, to the space community, I think, especially generating databases um, or infrastructure, creating actual products and so on. Because for me personally, I think there's lack in the scientific community because they focus always on paper, paper, paper. But if you could focus um, or join the um, citizen science community to create actual products, more libraries and so on, this would benefit everyone, I think. And so this is my, my passion, you know, just doing some machine learning stuff uh, with asteroid data and so on, just for me, myself. <laughs> And on the other hand, creating tutorials and also now starting some tutorials on YouTube for um, for the space topic. And yeah, I can share some links later in the uh, general chat if you're interested in. Yeah. Um, yep, that's basically me. Great. Thank you yeah. very much. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Uh, that was like so uh, encouraging and inspiring. Uh, one should uh, go and check his tutorials. They are like uh, really amazing. Uh, my 10 year old is waiting for a star in Orion constellation to explode and she wants to see a real black hole. Like she has millions of questions and uh, I don't have convincing answers. And today she is excited to attend this session because uh, we have two guys with us, uh, members of EHT team, the team who got us the first ever image of a black hole, black hole uh, at the center of galaxy M87. So Kazu and Andrew, please. Sure. Uh, let me share my screen uh, to show some slide. Um, um, can Can anyone see the screen? Uh, yes, please go ahead. Okay, works. Okay. Uh, so thanks for having us in PyCon India. I, I'm Kazak Yama from MIT Haystack Observatory um, at East Coast of the United States. Um, so Andrew and I are part of an international group of scientists providing these astronomy pictures. So I believe most of you saw these, you know, somewhere in the last couple of years. So this is the first ever picture of black hole, uh, you know, one of the most exotic and mysterious object in our universe. So here you see a ring of light lens at the you know, edge of black hole due to the, its strong, strong gravity. So you can see this ring is actually illuminating in the center of dark shadow here. So that is created by the event horizon of this black hole. You know, where no escape of light or any information is not allowed. 
So recently we have updated image. Maybe you already saw it. Um, so now you see a many spiral-like lines of the link. You know, these are visualizing the polarization of the light. So this highlights something also invisible. So these are these spiral arm-like patterns of polarization reveal the structure of magnetic field at the edge of the event horizon of the black hole. So the black hole is one of the highest density objects in the sky and therefore extremely compact. So the angular diameter of this link is just only one over 100 million in degrees. So this is like a like an orange on the moon seen from the ground. So if you look at the sky, seeing the moon, and if you can see an orange on its surface, that is the size of this link. And so to obtain, you know, such a you know, definitely finest view of the universe, uh, we really need a literally a planet-sized telescope. So our picture is obtained at radio band and uh, or most preci more precisely microwave band. So in radio telescopes are you know like uh, such kind of parabolic antennas. And then uh, and we, if we have an R size telescope, you know the, this big big dish, I mean of the meter, will capture the light from the black hole and then correct them into the focus here. But of course, you know, in the reality, we cannot make a, such a big dish. <laughs> so, so what, like, what we are doing is, you know, instead of having a you know literary planet size telescope, um, just putting an array of telescope on the uh, di at the distinct geographic side across this planet, and then and combining signals, uh, you know, where which actually each telescope is receiving, and then computationally form such an R size telescope. So we form it in we focus it in a computer. So this is how we made these images. So to make it happen, we formed an array of radio telescopes operated at the microwave uh, wavelengths, uh, named Event Horizon Telescope. Um, you know, uh, you can see the network of EHT array, which indeed has a planet size. And, and to operate such an international planet size array, we of course need an international team of scientists. So this is the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. Now a group more than 300 amazing scientists. Uh, I mean, and Andrea and I are just only a part of this amazing, you know, fantastic cooperation. So, uh, you know, the, this, this conference is PyCon, you know? So how our Pythons are involved in this cooperation? So I'd like to switch myself to Andrea for that. Great, uh, thank you, Kazu. Um, maybe you can go to the next slide. Yeah, so Kazu talked a little bit about the physical event horizon telescope, um, you know, the, the, tel the physical telescopes and, um, and the people who, who operate them, but a huge part of our work is, is computational. As Kazu said, we're taking these signals from different telescopes all around the world and trying to combine them to sort of simulate what we might see if we were able to build a telescope the size of the Earth. Um, and a huge part of this computational work goes on in Python. Um, this is just a small scattering of the types of Python um, libraries that we use. Um, and we've developed a whole bunch of different Python um, libraries and software tools of our own for, for this project, um, relying on this great community of people and existing work um, that has really been helpful in, in allowing us to, to flexibly develop very um, powerful and easy things to, 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 to analyze these data. Um, next slide. Um, so one thing to emphasize about the DHG data is that we're sort of taking a huge amount of data, we're recording tons and tons, petabytes of signals um, at each telescope and then sort of trying to um, reduce that into just an image which is only a few pixels um, even with the resolution of a telescope the size of the earth we're just barely seeing um, this black hole which is really really small as seen from earth so we're taking these data that are petabytes in size and reducing them to, to kilobytes in this final image um, trying to extract out um, from all of these noise and, and different corrupting effects that we get from the atmosphere from, from um, electronics um, trying to extract out this one small image on the sky. Come next slide. So there are tons of different um, things that happen at these different stages. Um, just one stage of the problem is what we call the imaging stage, which is something that Kazu and I have really worked at uh, on a lot. Um, so this is where, you know, because we don't have a telescope that fills out the entire um, the entire Earth, we only have a few different points that we're, we're sampling around the, the surface of the Earth. Um, we have very sparse measurements. So that means um, that there are lots of different solutions for an image that could fit the data. Um, there are an infinite number um, formally of images that, that could explain the data that we receive. And so we have to use algorithms to try to 
um, sift between these different images and, and find the image that best explains the data and that um, explains also that it satisfies also all of our um, assumptions and physical knowledge of the, the system. Now, next slide. So for the EHD, we've developed several different software tools that do this step. Um, just two that I want to highlight are ones that I developed and Cosmo developed. So on the left here is a is the EHD imaging Python software package that I developed um, for, for this task of imaging, of taking the, the EHD data and producing a, an image of a black hole. And on the right is a, a snapshot of the Smiley software package that, that Kazu developed um, that, that does the similar task um, with the same task. They do they have many things in common, but also were developed independently. So um, that's one thing that we really like to um, do in the EHT is approach different um, topics um, from sort of different angles with different different software. Um, Python makes developing all the software really, really flexible. We can learn from each other while also maintaining things, um, keeping things some independence that we can test each other and, and make sure that we're not making mistakes, we don't have bugs, we don't have assumptions that don't hold up. Uh, next slide. Um, so yeah, this is just sort of highlighting that idea. Again, one of the really critical things that allowed us to know that we were on the right track is when we were able to reproduce the this image, this result um, from sort of three different independent methods. Um, and this is something we always try to do is try to, to reproduce our work and um, use different methods to arrive at the same result to establish confidence. Um, so yeah, that's a lightning introduction to, to the work that we did with the EHD. Yeah, such an amazing work, and that was so inspiring. I guess we have spent a little more time uh, in this than planned, but uh, there was much needed to know about what panelists are doing and their passion and their work. Uh, let's uh, quickly go to the questions now, and I expect like responses. And there are many questions coming from uh, audience as well. Uh, my first question is for Arthur. Uh, you have been doing great work through uh, LibraCube, so. Uh, please tell us like how one can contribute to LibraCube and where to find the information quickly. Well, the information is on the website. Uh, that would be your starting point, LibraCube.org. And uh, it's open for everyone to join. So really everyone. Um, we also have a channel on Matrix so where we can chat. Um, uh, mostly the question comes up, how can I join? What pro projects can I contribute to? Um, but uh, actually, I'm quite good in uh, making projects and uh, laying out uh, like what I expect from projects. But this overall organization, I'm still in the learning progress and most fascinating is for me how the Linux kernel, mm -hmm. how they organize themselves. And if you have an idea how you know to build up this kind of organization, then please also get in contact with me. And okay. yeah. I would, I would love to. But I guess if I uh, work for LibraCube, I won't get uh, paid for. So my question is like, why would someone want to work on LibraCube projects for free? Like yeah, it's actually well, most of the um, the work is is um, not paid. That's true. It's voluntary. Um, uh, it's like, and it's really a passion. Yeah, people people uh, that join they really have an interest in space and space exploration. What benefit you get is if you put something, if you have joined our projects and you put something on your CV, like uh, you have implemented a CFTP protocol, uh, I think this makes an impression if you apply at NASA or any other space organization or space industry that might be an asset. And uh, the, the other point is that we have also scholarships from time to time, like we just completed a Google Summer of Code. We had two students. so. If you join and you're already in this community, then it's easier to yeah, to, then to find something for you to Great. that you paid and somehow. I guess uh, Catherine wants to add something to it. Yeah, yeah I was going to say uh, from both from like working at Planet and working at um, Open Source Robotics Foundation or Open Robotics, um, you know, even though it's open source and maybe you're not always getting paid directly to contribute to open source, there are lots and lots of like benefits to working on open source and it'll most likely help you find work. I like what comes to mind is um, the guys who the who wrote GDAL, which is this rectification software that I think everyone uses to do earth imaging or a good number of people use. And they the core devs there I don't think ever have to worry about finding a job to work on GDAL. Same with a lot of the ROS developers as well. Yeah, true. Okay, uh, now I'm coming to you, uh, Thomas. Uh, tell us what is your astrophysical background and how did 
Python help you to fulfill your academic goals? <clears throat> yeah, so uh, good question. Um, well, I just mentioned at the very beginning that um, I worked at uh, ESA as an internship for like, I think, yeah, six and a half months or so back in 2012. And this was my very first contact with Python. I have to admit that um, I studied physics, so a lot of lab work and so on. And then my supervisor said, um, here, take this book. I think this programming language is amazing. Maybe you want to try it out. And I said, well, OK, let's try it out. And this was my first Python contact. And it really helped me um, yeah, conducting some numerical experiments. Uh, later, uh, for the Rosetta mission, also for Cassini, um, Python was like the tool to really um, create data uh, reduction pipelines, feature engineering, and so on, also for plotting routines, also creating web applications, and so on. So I just wanted to get the job done, right? So this was like the best, the best, the best, um, yeah, the best programming language to choose. Um, and this really helped to, to generate the data. I mean, at the end of the day, it was important to generate results. And instead of yeah, starting with some low-level programming language, Python was like the, the best choice. And also with all the amazing libraries out there, like Scikit-Learn, Keras, TensorFlow, and so on, you don't have to reinvent the wheel, right? And uh, can simply start with uh, applying all these uh, methods from the beginning on. Of course, you have to know what to do exactly, right? So what's the scientific right. question and so on. Uh, so you just cannot just play around. But um, yeah, the, 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 the starting hurdle is quite low. You can just, just get the data. If you have the data, you can start. Uh, true. Like uh, uh, I am from a non-computing background. And like when I had my first encounter with Python, uh, you all must be knowing that comic from XKCD. Like uh, it says, import anti-gravity and you start flying. <laughs> Python gives you power. OK, uh, yeah, Arthur wants to come in here. Yeah, I agree totally that uh, Python is a the language that doesn't get into your way. So you have your idea that you want, uh, or your problem that you want to solve, and you can just write the code, and you, it's so readable. I, I mean, we all, I guess, we have worked with uh, C, C++, maybe Assembler, or even Java, and uh, I always find it hard to, you know, remember the syntax for those languages. But Python is, yeah. is almost just ri like writing uh, English and has a rich mm -hmm. ecosystem. And what I wanted to add also is that um, for embedded programming, um, there always comes the comment that, yeah, for embedded, you need C or, you know, really low level. Uh, but there's this MicroPython project that really lets you program your small microcontroller. And maybe eventually you might port this then to C, but at least you can already get started quickly and try out or for um, measurements, this works very well. And uh, this is really what amazes me about Python, this rich ecosystem. And yeah, you can use Python for almost yeah. everything. Great. And and that uh, semicolon doesn't trouble you anywhere. Yeah. So I have a, <laughs> okay. I have a quick question for Thomas. Uh, uh, what are your current space related projects and uh, what is coming next? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for the question. So uh, currently I'm developing a small library called SolarY because I think it also came up in the questions in the uh, in the in the in the yeah, in the yeah, stage yeah, yeah, session yeah. in the chat okay. that uh, where to get all the data, right? And that's very diff okay. difficult. There are certain um, um, databases also from NASA and ESA and so on where you can get the data, also calibrated data because uncalibrated data is really like hell. And um, but 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 there is no really like a consolidated product or website where it just it summarizes everything. There is the International Astronomical Union where you can also find the Minor Planet Center for Asteroids. There is the Inter um, the International Meteor Conference and organization where you can meteor data and so on and so forth. You just have to stick around and find around, and it's easier if you come from this background. Then you know where are the data. But as a citizen scientist, you just say, yeah, well, I have no idea. So with the solar Y, I just try to at least cover the minor object uh, topic a little bit. So starting with asteroids, starting with meteors, and at some point also maybe with the Cassini dust data where, that I would like mm -hmm. to um, pro uh, provide in a calibrated form and upload them somewhere in the cloud. And beside that, of course, also the tutorial stuff, right? Because um, you can learn programming, you learn programming quite easily, but if you check Reddit, for example, where people ask yeah what can i do next the question is always what can i do and they don't know it they don't have any idea for any project so 
of course, there are these books like I think um, Automate Your Boring Stuff and so on. But um, really working on actual scientific project is very difficult for, let's say, somebody who has no academic background. And I think with tutorial sessions, with really getting in contact with scientists, you can really contribute something. And even if it's, let's say, yeah, not writing a paper, but reducing the data or introducing machine learning algorithms to support scientists, this would really help. And um, yeah, I hope I hope to build up a small community around this idea a little bit. So uh, so let's see. Great. OK, so uh, let's move on to Catherine now. Like uh, much of your work involves programming in Python, and you have worked on projects like using satellite imagery uh, for uh, how, like uh, for some environmental issues, like to make an impact on the world. And now you are into space robotics. So, what do you think the next twenty years of space exploration will look like? Well, I think there's a <clears throat> there's a lot of uh, you know definitely going to see proliferation of more and more and more and cheaper satellites and the ability to put them up has become amazingly cheap. I think there's also, I mean, I think everyone here can speak more to me than what I could say. There's going to be more earth imaging as well, or imaging from earth that's going to uh, increase over the next 20 years. Um, the, the question really remains is what do you do with that data once you get it? You know, and I see it over and over and over again is that this data comes down and then it's like, well, what kind of questions can we solve with this? How do we actually get it to like, um, get it to people in a useful way, right? Like um, the things that come to mind, especially regarding like climate change and forest fires and stuff is you can get some really um, high quality, very timely data now, um, but getting it to say a firefighter or a farmer or somebody who can use it um, is still not a solved problem. There's just this big, disconnect. There's people in front of laptops that are sitting there actually looking at all this stuff, but then getting it to the person who can actually use it and getting them into a way that, um, you know, yeah, they can digest it is, is really difficult. Problem. And that's, that's where I think Python's going to come in a lot. And, um, so you know, on, just, on the same note, uh, I have another quick question for you. Like, how do you think space exploration has changed in the past 10 years? Um, well, I, it's gotten incredibly cheap. Well, I wouldn't say incredibly cheap, but it's gotten much cheaper and it's gotten much easier to to put things up into space and to get a hold of, you know, to, to prototype really. And to see, at least what I've seen is um, people, as things have gotten cheaper, people have been willing to take more risks, right? Before it was like, this thing has to work. It has to be radiation hardened. It has to be, you know, we have to put it in a thermal chamber and really put it through space. And now it's kind of like, well, you know, it's only going to cost this much. We can We can be a little bit more you know, give something a shot. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. You know, right. Arthur, you, you have, you probably see a lot of this. Um, yeah, uh, that's true. But I don't really like this trend, I must say, because it's creating a lot of space debris. And uh, that's what I actually, that's why I've, one of, that's one of the reasons why I started LibreCube is to really, because we have a lot of universities developing CubeSats, I'm sure. Many of the people here in the in the in the oh, session they they also somehow are involved with the CubeSat maybe because all over the world they're building CubeSats but they're not sharing information so they're repeating the same mistakes all over again it's mostly power related or communication mm -hmm. I've launched two CubeSats and one of them the second one was actually a big failure and we did not even communicate with it we're not able so this drove me that we need to go open source we need to have platforms that work. And then we can put some experimentation on top of this, but the basic thing must work so that we can ma always make sure where's the thing and maybe even maneuver it so that we avoid having, uh, you know, yeah, avoid having space debris. But overlay is, is true. Uh, we have a rapid, kind of more rapid prototyping um, for space nowadays as it was in maybe 10, 20 years, uh, 20 years ago, yeah. Okay, so we are running out of time. So let me quickly go to the next question. Uh, Kazu is a developer of uh, Smiley, like a Python interface library for uh, uh, imaging uh, with Event Horizon Telescope. And Andrew is also a primary developer for another uh, 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 library, uh, ETH Imaging, Okay, primarily made for EHD data. So my question to both of you is, uh, why did you have to develop a new software for making black hole images for the EHD? 
and uh, how is it different from software normally used in the field? Like yeah, why so these new, a, new tools? Yeah, so that's a that's a great that's a great question. So, um, so uh, actually, the we are using a techniques of the very long baseline interferometry to make a partial Earth size telescope. So this is not it not itself is not new. Actually, it was like uh, coming from the nineteen seventies. But uh, what is new is um, we are observing at extremely short wavelengths as a radio. Um, so uh, uh, that is something very different from the conventional one. And, and uh, in general, okay, if we observe at the short wavelengths, and then uh, we will highly affected by atmosphere. And, and actually that actually cropped a lot of actually uh, telescope signals and the uh, imaging problem is more and more, more, and more challenging. Um, so one of the very big difficulties is actually we need to handle uh, this kind of you know, uh, the, the atmospheric effect you know, built in the imaging. And also another thing is uh, you know, we have a planet size dish, but we only have, uh, you know, so for instance, to make that picture of you know, first images of black hole, we only use telescope at just a five distinct geographic side. You know, across the globe, mm -hmm. so um, we cannot fill up the entire Earth as a kind of virtual meter. So uh, we we basically have a, you know very sparse measurement of the uh, source information from the sky. So uh, these actually challenges, you know, may actually pose a very big limitations uh, to the standard uh, techniques used in uh, very long baseline interferometry previously, and uh, we need to actually develop some you know. You know, smart algorithm to solve actually in far what are the you know likely image on the sky, so so that's why we need to develop first of all new algorithm and also the software that implement the new algorithm. So that's actually the primary motivation um, of uh, many folks, including myself and and Andrew, to develop the new software packages. And uh, and that's not even not only for imaging. You know, every single part. Uh, of the data process in the EHT actually need a technical actually like innovations. Um, so you know, under show that you know the data are you know huge like a petabyte, and and uh, in the, at the end is the kilobyte. And so we really need to handle the framework to uh, you know handle such huge uh, big data as well. So uh, so the EHT basically faces many challenges in every single step of the signal chain, and actually that motivate the development of new software. Yeah, one thing I want to emphasize too is that you know we are still using um, sort of traditional software and traditional techniques alongside some of the newer stuff that we're developing. We're in house with the with, with Python with the EHT, um, and you know testing these methods against each other. And there you know there are some things that the the newer software does better. There are lots of things that we can learn from the sort of more uh, traditional um, software packages that have been used for for decades at this point. Um, and yeah, it's really by testing these, these methods against each other that we establish a lot of confidence in, in our final result. Um, one thing that's great from my perspective and the, the, about the new software that we develop in Python primarily is that you know it's much easier for everyone to contribute to um, and to develop and to, to, to you know, take ideas that we come up with for one project and apply them to another um, to, to, to make changes on the fly in some of these older packages, which you know have a lot of a long legacy and are very stable. And that's very good because they're useful for a lot of different um, um, prob problems. But you know, for when we're trying to do things quickly and to, to, to make progress fast and just improve um, and get as much out of our data as we possibly can, um, that kind of flexible development is really helpful. Great. OK, so a quick uh, short answer from both of you. Like, uh, we all Pythonistas would like to know, why Python for these libraries? Yeah, I think it's basically what I just said that you know Python is super easy to to experiment and for to to I think it was said earlier to to take you know work open source work that has been done by others um, and, and plug it in and and play with new ideas and tools and so we really rely on on all that development that's done in tons of open source packages and that's just really helped us experiment quickly and and put together new ideas um, rapidly and with a lot of success. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, yeah, just like, uh, one single point. Yeah, and and another thing is it's already suggested in this session. Um, you know, DWT is one of the key. Um, so so I would say um, I I would just just make sure that astronomers are not good programmers. You know, we are not professional you know, astronomers, right? And uh, 
And but still, we need to work with uh, you know people, or, you know, a group more than you know three hundred people. And uh, and so uh, so kind of like easy to write, and also the clear readability to maintain the code is it's just crucial. I mean, for this kind of international cooperation, that is, I think, what really uh, Python is the real solution for the EHD. Okay, so I have a few questions left with me now, but I think we have only eight to ten minutes uh, left. And therefore, if there are any uh, interesting questions from audience, let's take them first. Uh, Bhavin, can you just help us or? Yeah, uh, in the Earth size telescope slide, there is a label light from the black hole. How and what does it mean? If light can't escape black hole due to infinite gravity, then how can we capture light from it? Um, yeah, that's a really good um, point. But sometimes astronomers were, were sloppy about these things, um, exactly what we say. So basically what we mean when we say light from a black hole is light that's emitted just outside the black hole. So this black hole is surrounded by plasma, by superheated gas that's um, billions of degrees, and that, that is emitting radio light that we see. It's bent by the black hole, so we see the effects of the black hole's gravity in bending the light. But that, it's absolutely right that we don't see the actual light from the black hole itself, because um, once it gets when something gets onto the actual black hole, it's um, it's invisible to us. Okay. Any other interesting question from audience? Yeah, this is for EHT team again. Uh, can you help us with learning suggestions while setting up uh, proof of concepts from such initiatives with respect to computer engineering? How did you take this one? Sure. Uh, I'm not sure actually I, I clearly understand these questions, but uh, um, wait, I, pro I probably need a, <laughs> is that actually like asking about the imaging yeah. techniques or? Yeah. Even the question is not clear to me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We'll take it in the chat later on. Can we have the next <laughs> okay. question? <laughs> well, actually one thing I can say is that, um, so, so basically we, when we actually face the challenges uh, like like uh, imaging, you know, or you know other data processing, you know, this is usually something actually not done in 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 the field. So uh, we usually actually look for like what's happening in the other field. Uh, so for myself, actually, I I, I started um, to take a look at you know the imaging techniques uh, actually coming from the medical imaging. Um, I look at the techniques like what what kind of techniques are used in the medical imaging or you know other field which have a very similar mathematical structure. That was the uh, um, actually motivated us uh, to how to develop imaging techniques. So um, I don't know to say, uh, but uh, often actually it's very nice to just look at, you know, outside of the field and how smart people out in, in the other field actually feel. Uh, I just saw uh, you know, it's a very similar kind of problem. That is very helpful. I'm not sure this un answered your question, but. Uh, Okay. <laughs> so the next question is, uh, ah, okay, uh, not exactly directly related to Python. Would like to know what is astrophysicist community take about UAP, uh, especially with the release of videos from Pentagon. Okay, who would like to take this question? Seems like no one, me, me not, because my focus is really on CubeSats, uh, Python for Space, so that's maybe more user community, science community question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's let's keep the, it. The only thing I can say is I've seen a lot of satellite imagery and I've never seen a UAP, so. <laughs> and yeah. what I can say is that <clears throat> this is the answer I expected. If this kind of question comes, nobody likes to answer it somehow. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. Sorry, what is UAP? Is it like a UFO or what? I yeah, it's even... unidentified yeah. astro something phenomenon. Okay. Yeah, similar to, to UFO, yeah. Okay, so we have just three to four minutes remaining. Uh, yeah, let's take one last question and then I have one more final question for every one of you and like 10 second will answer. How much improvements accessibility in the area of cloud computing has helped in data processing for astro data? And is it still done on specially built 
on prem servers maybe i can say something so um I think that I can now not speak now for the astrophysicists with their with, who have really terabyte of data. I think uh, uh, the other guys can answer it, but especially spacecraft probes. So most people think that spacecraft probes they generate maybe terabyte or petabyte of data, but that's actually not true because the downlink is very very small. So you compress the data, you have to really select it, and take for example the Cassini spacecraft. It was flying around for what like. 20 years or so and in total it generated binary data of around i think 400 gigabyte over 20 years and then you take a small fraction of it which was the instrument i was working on you unzip it you feed it with extra data you make data engineering every fancy glancy thing you can imagine and at the end of the day of uh, um, 20 years of uh, uh, measurement we had like 250 gigabyte database and you can imagine we do not we do not need it, uh, a cloud platform. We had an on-prem system because it was cheaper for us in this case. And but I, I can imagine, of course, that if you have petabyte of data, you need, of course, some kind of data lake or something, right? Right. I mean, I, I just had one. My experience has been the opposite, but it's lots and lots of data. The cloud is great. Um, you know, I, I tend to suggest to people never do anything locally because the likelihood of you having to go and, and you know, the whole Silicon Valley thing is scaling stuff up. Now, that's, you know, there's a difference between fundamental science and, and uh, building products. But I, you know, I used to work at a microscopy company. It was the same thing. It's like, well, when the individual scientist does their thing on their one sample, it's great on your local machine. But you know, the next day somebody's going to come and say, well, you figure out how to find this disease. Now we want to do it for everyone. It's just easier to say, well, we're going to run that all in the cloud. Okay, uh, Bhavin, do we have any, uh, okay. Uh, Kazu wants to add something. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is actually a very nice question. And this is also a relevant topic for the EHD. Um, so so just show the EHD use on both actually on premise servers and also a cloud computing. Um, so for instance, when we actually uh, form the virtual our size telescope, that is a kind of well defined procedure. And, uh, you know, we just need to run, you know, for you know, huge amounts of time. So that is actually using an on-premise server. We have a supercomputer at the observatory, for instance, to combine all the signals uh, from each telescope to form a partial tes telescope. On the other hand, actually, you know, so for instance, the, the imaging or data calibration part or data modeling part, it's more like, uh, you know, depending on data set and what is your goal. So, so for instance, these um, black hole images um, presented from the our collaboration is actually processed at the Google Cloud. Um, so we need a, a kind of just instantaneous shot of the huge computation, and 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 also this actually should be part by actually many people, you know, across the globe. I mean, you know, in the collaboration. So uh, the cloud computing is much easier actually to learn this kind of stuff. So, uh, so I, I'd say we are still actually have both benefit from the on-premise server and also uh, you know more flexible framework of the cloud computing. So uh, yeah, these are, most of them are very important for the EHD. Okay, uh, so I'll, I'll put uh, quick questions for all of you, like uh, a combined question. Like most satellites from ESA and NASA uh, till today, they run software written in C or ADA. Like, so the question is, will Python ever be used in space? Yeah, in, in real sense. What's the future? Um, okay, so I would like to hear Catherine's opinion on that, actually, because you have worked with, I mean, I'm supporting now uh, ESA, European Space Agency, and we I'm involved in this, let's say, more traditional style of satellites, the huge satellites, you know, the flight to Jupiter. And uh, there, they're more conservative and they want to have everything testable. So that should be C or other code. Um, but I imagine that uh, commercial and, and startups, they're more agile in developing and they're more, you know, take more risks. And I guess they would go for the, the language that can be implemented and give the fastest results. So I would imagine that Python is used a lot, maybe for Planet Labs, but I don't know. Maybe you can share something. I didn't do a ton of onboard uh, work but I wouldn't be surprised if it isn't already. You know, the the 
onboard work that I did do, I can't talk a lot about, but it was more in C. Um, but, it, you know, at the end of the day, all the satellites are just Linux boxes. So who knows what scripts running behind, you know, some sort of cron job that runs every once in a while to do something. It's probably a Python script. So there you go. Okay. Uh, I would like to hear uh, on this from Catherine and Thomas. Uh, how do you get career in space exploration? Or how citizen scientists or Pythonistas can contribute? Um, my general recommendation is just to start doing cool stuff. I actually talked to a student a couple weeks ago, and she was really interested in, in doing space stuff. And the one thing I suggested is like, well, you know, try, apply, like, but you may not get a job. There's a lot of people interested and not a lot of slots. But the thing I said is like, maybe you can come at it from a different angle. Like, um, I'm sure everyone here who's building a satellite or whatever, there, there are all these different bits of hardware. You don't build everything from scratch, right? You buy this imager, you buy this, you know, battery, you buy, you know, all these different parts. And if you're really interested, maybe start with some of the, you know, the vendors that actually built the parts that go into these big systems. And that way you can get, it's a little bit um, of a back door into the industry. I think that is one way of approaching it. And what I can say about the maybe citizen scientists. So the question is the second, how um, how can citizen scientists or Pythonists contribute and generate scientific output? Depends a little bit on the task. So it's very difficult, I would say, for someone who has no academic affiliation to really write scientific papers because sometimes, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but sometimes this publishing industry can be quite conservative. And I think that big contributions can be done with really working on astronomy, astronomical uh, libraries or products or uh, solutions that uh, generate, uh, generate data, feature engineer the data and so on. And as always, you have to get in contact with people, right? So if you think, hey, I'm quite confident with my machine learning skills or you are maybe a freelancer, you want to support something, just approach the guys. It's also the same with the students, right? This, uh, the, you, you like the students that come maybe in the second semester and say, hey, I would like to program something, please help me. So you think, oh, this guy has motivation. And um, it's maybe something, really something about, yeah, your commitment to, uh, or you, you, your self-presentation, how you, how you would like to contribute things. Yeah, Arthur, please, Arthur. I think the fastest way, really, if you want to get a job in space industry is you start a space company. <laughs> you could sell the open source products that we develop at Liebel Group, for example. Okay, great. Uh, Kazu, Andrew, you want to add something? A quick uh, 10 seconds response? Um, <laughs> so, I... So it's it's not for the EHT, but actually the in astronomy, actually many citizen scientists actually join in in the you know many many aspects of the astronomy work. For instance, like uh, uh, helping identify the object, that is actually one of the primary area that citizen scientists really help. Um, actually, there are many ways to join. Actually, we um, often actually need people's eye to see the sky. Um, I, Andrew, do you, do you have any addition? <laughs> no, I think that's right. I think, um, you know, just by contributing to the overall Python ecosystem too, you can contribute to, to different space projects and especially the ESG project in, in unexpected ways. I think, you know, the, the amount of dependencies that we have, we rely on a bunch of things that people contribute to, even if they don't necessarily contribute directly to, to our software libraries, for example, which can require some specific domain knowledge if you're, working on some of these larger projects, you're, you're definitely making an impact in, in the HD. Maybe one, I, I wish one this last, to be... last, okay, sorry. Please. Okay. No, please yeah, go Maybe ahead. My, my last, my very last comment, maybe. Um, there are actually um, amateur communities out there, right? There are communities for asteroid observations. There are communities even for people observing transits of exoplanets, amateurs, for meteor observations, for atmospheric uh, phenomena. You just have to find these communities, and these communities are huge. They have a lot of knowledge, and um, I think being part of such a community is really more beneficial than, you know, just being you know, solo fighter trying to do something. Cool. So I really recommend searching for the proper community and um, there you get a lot of help. Yeah, that was amazing. Uh, I wish uh, this could be continued for like another hour, but uh, we are uh, running out of time. So that was amazing. Uh, you guys were awesome. And thank you for being us.
taking us on this journey. Uh, you have definitely inspired our young Pythonistas. Thank you so much. And to the audience, I'm sure this session has ignited your passion to dive into the world of Python, learn persistently, discover, and create so that you too can one day help us all understand a little more about world beyond the earth. So we are ending this session here.